All right, great. We are going to let attendees fill in for just a moment. Great, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, <laughs> depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar, Sustainable Food Systems, Mainstreaming Natural Resource Management. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks, and before we begin, I want to orient you to our Zoom event. On the bottom of your screen, you'll find most of your controls. Please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, you can use the Q&A button in the toolbar on the left. Please indicate who your question is for or if it's just for the group at large. You can ask questions throughout the event and our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar just after a brief panel discussion. Lastly, we are recording the webinar and we'll email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can find the resources at agrilinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Emily Weeks. Thank you, Michael. Really appreciate the time here today. Um, we're excited about this month on sustainable food systems, particularly in light of the theme of mainstreaming natural resource management. I noticed there's quite a few people joining us today. So thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we have quite a, a full panel session and discussion today, so we are getting started on time. I know that people are still joining, so welcome to those who, who are joining now. So today's topic is something that has been uh, a theme every year, and uh, we've had a stream of work uh, supported across the agency, across our bureaus, that we uh, continue to try and emphasize the importance of, and today's uh, illustration coming from our missions is quite key in highlighting the relevance of this work. Next slide, please. So we have a, 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 a selection of speakers today from both USAID and from our uh, colleagues at C4. Uh, looking forward to Dr. Robert Nassi, a Chief Operating Officer from C4, providing us with opening remarks and following on with a panel session from our mission uh, in Peru and in Mozambique, Alison McAlady and Mofat Nagugi, uh, coming from our Marine Water and uh, uh, Team Lead from Alison in Peru and our Natural Resource uh, team lead in, uh, in Mozambique. Next slide, please. So just giving you a little bit of background and context on today's topic. Uh, some of you who might have uh, been with us for a while are aware that USAID has gone through several transitions in relation to natural re resource management and agriculture and food systems. Over the years, since the 1980s, we've focused on integrating natural resource management into our portfolios. And uh, we've had many uh, changes amongst our bureaus in order to accommodate this, starting off with our EGAT center, moving on to splitting our centers and uh, refining our centers. So moving from BFS and E3 to RFS and DDI, just throwing out some acronyms as we like to do at USAID. And finally, coming to a new uh, period in our uh, programming where we will uh, transition to, uh, again, a combination of our food security and environment work, which is what brings us a, an opportunity for the thought leadership that we welcome across our partners and across our colleagues at USAID. So next slide, please. So we're all facing the challenge across many of our, our different streams of environmental work in climate and resilience, in, in marine uh, uh, and, and water security and uh, land and resource management. And so with that challenge, uh, we still are trying to improve on how we best can address each of the elements of, of integration across work streams that may not traditionally incorporate particularly natural resource management. And so in order, particularly at USAID, to, to be able to do that, we commissioned a study 
uh, across our um, our two bureaus in particular, but primarily focused on our Feed the Future work that looked across our portfolios at Mission and Washington to determine where are the gaps and what are the needs that we to uh, to be addressed in order to improve our programming, but also to really meet these challenges uh, that we're facing coming out of many of the reports that we're seeing today. Uh, the global report reports that are affecting us all in regards to biodiversity loss, um, changes in, in impacts in climate, and building a secure future in regards to food security. Next slide, please. So just noting uh, that the, 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 the goal of the report was to improve mainstreaming of natural resource management and, uh, and also integration of climate change across mitigation and adaptation, and really also looking into environmental policy and resource governance. So the, again, highlighting the, the theme today around mainstreaming coming out of that report and looking at examples of opportunities from that report and, and moving forward. Next slide, please. So overall, why should we mainstream? And just coming out of the report, the quote, to achieve USAID's ambitions, food security, climate, and climate goals, NRM interventions should be expanded, coordinated, and monitored across scales and sectors. One of the key findings, one of the key recommend recommendations coming from our missions from the surveys that were conducted. Next slide, please. Now, from here on, my slides are relatively dense, and the purpose is because these will be available after this webinar, and uh, so therefore the information you can access directly from the slides. So I'll speak to some of the points across these slides. So just giving you a quick highlight of what was done in this report, USA did a review across 11 countries. And, uh, and looked across 17 of the 33 RFS priority countries. We uh, through the report, looked at key programming that integrated NRM and water resource management are along with climate change and land and resource governments, and identified the gaps uh, across each of the countries, and then determined recommendations from mission staff, uh, anonymous recommendations that also led to uh, some guidance in regards to indica indicators and measurements moving forward. Next slide, please. And so what is USA doing? And today we have some great examples from our missions from Ali and from um, Mofat, uh, looking at some of the great work that our missions are doing, but just a, a high level across this review, we found that there's uh, co-programming with BHA, particularly in, in the example of Ethiopia, uh, consistent resilience programming across our uh, portfolios within uh, our missions, but particularly in our resilience target countries. We're addressing pastoralism and farmer and, the, and inter ethnic conflict in the Sahel, Kenya, and Uganda. We have safety net programming, addressing large scale farmer and pastoralist led vegetation and regeneration work, again, representing some BHA work, and co programming um, in protected areas. Um, particularly in Mozambique, which we'll hear from today. We also highlighted the new Hearth and Sustainable Intensification Innovation Lab MEL approaches um, that were key to providing guidance for some of our other programming and, and looking forward into um, new opportunities for integration. Next slide, please. But uh, we also found gaps in some of the key uh, needs that were uh, recommended across our missions and, and highlighted from the portfolios, the need to really mobilize leadership at a high level for support for this work. And also align our funding streams. Of course, you're aware we have different funding streams and they don't necessarily overlap or, or are integrated to be able to address a combined uh, set of issues. Uh, within particular zones or areas of which we're working in. Uh, increase in forms of, of particularly uh, funding coming out of our uh, RFS portfolios, specifically to climate change resilience and, uh, and natural resource management, and also looking for additional mechanisms. How can we better integrate our partners, better integrate our thinking across our projects and programs, and even our offices and, and with our uh, uh, corresponding partners. Again, a great opportunity here today to build that collaboration. And finally, really honing into the, the need for better indicators and measuring our success and the value of NRM and its impact in regards to integration. Next slide, please. 
So continuing on, there are more needs across synchronizing watershed work, inter synergizing NRM actions, and looking at incorporating more NRM approaches to food loss and waste. Next slide, please. So I would like to, and, and we'll pop it in the chat right now and also available after uh, if you want to correspond with us, but we did have three major outputs from this work, a full review that is only internal uh, for our uh, programming. So those of you joining us internally, we're happy to share that. For external uh, viewing, we have a leadership brief and mission technical notes um, that uh, have fallen into a policy review and also a, a shorter executive summary of the work that we did. So happy to provide those links again in the chat and also um, correspond after uh, today's webinar for any additional questions and, and information. Next slide, please. So uh, again, uh, highlighting that uh, today we have a great set of panelists and, and we're really excited to have Robert here. Thank you, Robert, for jumping in. Uh, it is a last minute change uh, due to illness, um, but we're very excited to have you and really appreciate the time you're taking. So I will hand it over to Robert from here. And then from there, we'll follow on with our panel session with uh, Ali and Mofat and uh, looking forward to the Q&A as well. Thank you, Michael. Um, I'll hand it back to you to pass on to Robert. Robert, thank you so much for stepping in and I'll pass it to you to give our keynote presentation. Uh, thank you, Emily and, uh, and, uh, and Michael, I mean, and all the, the colleagues from USAID. And uh, thank you very much for Ravi Prabhu, who was supposed to deliver this uh, presentation, but uh, unfortunately, uh, is uh, sick, but he's following us uh, carefully, make sure that I don't say something silly from his hospital bed in India. Uh, next slide. We are going to talk about uh, the whole issue of uh, the multiple benefit of system approach, uh, the importance of trees and forests to feed the present and the future. And of course, uh, we would like to remember you that when you hear action research, uh, think rather about transformative adaptive learning based on actionable evidence. And we will start with a quick uh, recapitulation. Uh, next slide, please. In March 2023, our colleague uh, Ami Kovic uh, introduced the notion of Nutriscape. And in fact, Nutriscape is the short for landscape that serves nutrition needs of the undernourished. And uh, right here, you can see it's about agrobiodiversity. It's about forest and diet. It's about landscape change uh, and dietary change. And it's about consumer behavior. So it's an integrated view across the landscape and across the resources with the importance of uh, the structuration of the landscape and, and forest trees and agroforestry system for food in terms of diversity, in terms of safety, in terms of security. Next. In fact, Amy connected the following dots. I mean, the sort of forests are not the silver bullet to solve malnutrition, but cutting forests, uh, and we include mangroves or pit forests for food security, that means to produce agricultural uh, commodities can make diets worse for local community. If there is no measurement of the benefits uh, for, for, from forests, it's hard for the policymaker to value forests and the uh, related uh, data benefits. And we need information on the individual intake and the use of uh, natural wild resources on food composition to understand nutrient contribution. And at the same time, we need to continue explaining the vital importance of wild food to food and nutrition security. Next. Uh, I found or rather Radhi found this recent USAID report pretty useful and thought provoking. And it was about a technical note on natural resource management in resilience and food security portfolio. But we would like also to add to the priorities incentivize, measure, and monitor, uh, hypothesize, consult, innovate, co create, and act. Next. And, and the question we should ask ourselves is that um, looking at the place of present food and security, and, and not simply uh, uh, ignoring the trees and the forest. You can wonder if we're asking ourselves the right question. If you look at the, the, this study about the uh, scoping review, you can see that there is a large amount of research on primary production on farm. And finally, a pretty scarce uh, thing about food safety, food security, and environment, and, and else also. So it's very much 
question of are we asking ourselves the right question? And I will try to show in the next slide that there are ways that we can deal with that. Next. So let's get started. And uh, because Ravi kindly prepared a large number of very complex slides, it is going to be a, quite a gallop. And so prepare to buckle up. And if you have any question, I mean, as I said, Ravi is listening to us, he will be happy to answer the question. Next. Okay, across seven uh, country in Africa, we had this Regreening Africa project. And this project is the proof that systemic action uh, research uh, to restore tree cover and natural resource management function has worked in multiple ways. And, and you see the numbers, or I hope you can see them, uh, on between the baseline and, and the end line survey in terms of households uh, that were involved in restoration. And, and you can see that uh, in most cases, uh, the number of households have, have decreased in terms of their food and security. Next. And if you look, and I think this one has some animation, so maybe you need to click twice. Uh, sorry. I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, if you see about five years, uh, and you see an index, which is a synthetic index in terms of uh, the progress and, and uh, the, the ability of people to, have, to be better uh, using restoration, you can see that in any all our sites, uh, the situation has improved and there are consistently positive gains, both in, in uh, Ghana, uh, in, uh, back west. So that this, this is about the impact of uh, integrated management and farmer, farmer nat management natural resources. Next. And, and they were using the systemic indicator in terms of uh, FM and F, farmer managed natural regeneration, uh, various uh, intensity, the number of new trees and shrub in the main field, uh, the various agroforestry practice used uh, during the last 12 months, and uh, the importance in uh, female, dec female decision making uh, in terms. And, and you can see that it represents uh, progress in the extent of practice, the intensity of the practice, the diversity of the practice, and the intra household equity. So win, 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 win. Next. And at the same time, uh, during this project, uh, this program, Regreening Africa, has generated uh, uh, a lot of information. And we have created an application, the Regreening app, uh, which has now more than 150,000 participating farmers, and it's counting. And this app helps to show the type of information in terms of, OK, what is happening in farmer managed natural regeneration in Senegal or in Mali? What are the main spaces? What are the preference of the people? Where? So it, it's a very useful and, and very uh, effective app. Uh, and I really encourage you, if you haven't tried it, to test it, especially if you are involved in this issue in your work. Next. So the key attributes to keep in mind in the whole story is that scales matter. I mean, both a spatial scale, temporal scale, and also the social scale or leveling. Costs and benefit matters. I mean, so if we manage to harness uh, the ecology and the power of a complex executive system, we can lower the cost and increase the benefit. And there is always a need to innovate from one adaptive cycle to the other. So you need to use a range of tools and approaches that speed up evidence gathering as a basis of understanding. So you cannot simply wait that the project is finished to change the way you are proposing solution to the people. It has to be a constant adaptive system. Next. OK, another example, which the other one was more on starting on the bottom. Now, if we start at the top, uh, leveraging policy change. It's the story of the India agroforestry policy in 2014 and, and its no con effect. Uh, well, <clears throat> before the, the agroforestry uh, policy was uh, adopted, the, 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 this was not very much uh, part of the, the life of the people because fundamentally it will tell you what the tree belongs to the state. So I have no interest of having tree in my farm because fundamentally I cannot use the tree. And, and, and the agroforest tree policy has changed that and, and it has had a, a, a huge uh, knock-on effect 
uh, where you can see now about 70% of the country American timber requirement are made from tree on farm. It generates about $25 billion a year for the small holder. And, and during the period of 2015 to 2019, India's trees cover increased by about 2%. And out of these 2%, 1.7 comes from tree outside forest. And you could see on, on, on the uh, left side, uh, the amount of uh, benefits uh, and uh, revenue that was created to this uh, change in policy at the global level. Next. And then uh, it's important to look at the landscape, long term and judgment and, and, and the diversity of partner. And the first example is also in India, is the Andhra Pradesh engagement landscape about natural farming. Uh, what, what is an engagement landscape? It's a delivery mechanism that to, to we have designed in C4E Club, which is uh, a, a large uh, area of land where we try to implement a scale uh, the landscape approach uh, with a strong engagement and partner and hence the name engagement landscape. And uh, in this engagement landscape, you have exemplar landscape, which are more, more smaller units where you implement uh, some of the uh, innovation, so on, and, and that are adapted at, at the landscape level. And next, this um, uh, under Pradesh natural uh, farming program is massive. I mean, a sort of, and you see the numbers. I mean, in 2017, there was 40,000 farmers. In 2020, 480,000. In 2022, 630,000. In 2022, 2023, 1 million farmers and 460,000 hectares. And that the number of farmers increased 10 times and the number of villages increased 10 times. And in terms of uh, more women involved, small and marginal capital farmer are very more, 86 person. So it's, it's a transformation at the all landscape level and without the need uh, to have a cash incentive because it was all designed in a way that the thing is self-sustainable and is self-multiplicating. Next. Another, we are moving to another place of the world. It's uh, the uh, engagement landscape in San Martin, so the SMART in Peru, which is about, uh, in this case, leveraging some policy and the case of agroforestry concession. Uh, in this uh, uh, region in Peru, San Martin, the, the, you have the possibility if you have been more or less illegally established in the forest land to sign an agroforestry concession with, with the state. And uh, if you preserve a certain amount of forest in your farm and if you use agroforestry practice, then the title of the land is given to you for a a significant amount of time. I can't remember exactly. I, think, I can't remember if it's 25 years or 50 years, but, but then it gives you security. And then as a result, people are adopting that. And then it reduces uh, the deforestation. It avoids deforestation uh, about uh, 23, 20 20% of uh, land use and land use change emission have been avoided based on the two, 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 2012 uh, greenhouse gas inventory. And the agroforestry based restoration, adding trees in farm, has increased the potential of carbon storage uh, by uh, 3,000 gigaton of CO2 per year. So, uh, this is an example of uh, implementing um, a land policy uh, well conceived, and it's not perfect, we know, but has a significant impact both on the livelihood, on the deforestation, on the climate and on the food security of the people. Next. Uh, and then the continuation of the, the, the San Martin Peru, you have an explanation of how this works. I will not go into details, I mean, but this is for reference, but you can see it's quite a complex system, but fundamentally you put everybody uh, talking uh, and having a, a, this platform and you end up with something that is adaptive with some solutions. Next. Okay, now we are going about the engagement landscape in Para in Brazil, and, and the idea is uh, scaling key innovation for multiple benefits. 
And uh, here it's about uh, creating an agroforestry system with something that is not very common, oil palm. So you have oil palm, cocoa, and acai uh, agroforestry system. You have fruit fruit portfolio and, and, and restoration for agroforestry and livelihood. And the fruit tree portfolio, of course, is learning from our work in East Africa and, and the various methods that we have developed. And then you can see about where there is a gap in food security and where uh, the diversity of what you install in your agroforestry system has allows you to, 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 to pass this lean period using resources that are very diverse. Next. And <clears throat> We are also putting in place in this in this landscape uh, uh, agroforestry and restoration accelerator, which is the idea to uh, as a place designed as land restoration with agroforestry initiative with carbon credit uh, schemes. We are now adding a nutrition dimension to one of these landscape in, in Tome Achu municipality in Odopara, and, and it's really something that is a really a show on, uh, a specific mobilization of two of C4 aircraft K delivery mechanism. A transformative partnership platform, the Nutriscape TPP, working in an engagement landscape in the para engagement landscape. Next. <clears throat> and at the same time, nationally, you need to create the institutional demand for agroforestry and forest food by linking to the Biodiversity for Food and Nutrition Initiative in Brazil, which is a public policy uh, designed by the Brazilian Ministry. And, and there is an ordinance on social biodiversity in this policy that least a certain number, 18 native plant species with food value. The government encouraged the development of value chain processing and marketing for these species. There is a direct market outlet, and, and now this is updated to 101 species. Next. So if you are zooming on on unearthing diversity, I mean, restoring diversity, trees and forest cover is for multiple benefits. The right trees for the right place for the right reason. We see too many uh, of this program, which is simply, okay, let's plant 1 billion trees, but these are not the right trees and they are not maintained, so they all die. And you need to consider a whole system approach. I mean, so you cannot simply look at planting trees if you don't solve the reason why originally the place has been degraded. Next. Uh, <clears throat> and then you can think about portfolio and not species. So, so that means that you can develop climate appropriate portfolio of tree diversity, uh, which is in fact a portfolio of a certain number of trees that are necessary to supply diversity and respond to climate change and not simply planting one species. And we are currently being using that in, in Africa and we are going to implement that in Asia and Latin America. Next. And the, the, the purpose of, of this, I mean, is really, uh, reversing undernutrition among the most vulnerable, and you can customize food tree portfolio to promote diversity, to provide macronutrients. You can combine indigenous and exotic species for food tree and crop. You can look at seasonal availability and macronutrients. So you have a whole gamut of possibilities that you can look at uh, to ensure food security and at the same time, <laughs> more tree cover and a better uh, uh, sequestration of carbon at the landscape level, but if you look at the portfolio, not simply at cocoa or oil palm or, or coffee. Next. And, and of course, for that, you, you need to involve uh, the community in co-development of this portfolio. I mean, a sort of there, there is no way that you can come to the press and say that is what you should do. But, I mean, you need to co-develop the portfolio and then you need to bring the technical know-how that is missing to the community uh, or the seed source or the knowledge of some species, I mean, know, or some new ideas, but it's very important uh, to empower the community and center this activity around their active participation and appropriation of the technologies. Next. Okay, this, this one is about uh, a complex uh, picture. It's the whole idea of enrolling the donut for the people that are aware of the donut uh, uh, economy. And this whole idea is like what matter, in fact, is having people that are the steward of the land that are really in power to design how they want to have their land in order to be sustainable within the planetary boundary and at the same time deliver as much as possible of the uh, socioeconomic benefits and value benefits. Next. 
Okay, and uh, along with that, you also to harness uh, the genetic diversity uh, for effective adaptation and, and development, and looking at forgotten food, crop in, food crops in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, next, we have created uh, with some partner the African Orphan Crop Consortium, and the idea is to prioritize a forgotten food crop that are selected across various food groups uh, that have been forgotten and, and, and to develop uh, uh, training, to develop a seed source, to develop uh, uh, planting material for this and, and value chain for these uh, orphan crops. Next. Yeah, and then you have a list about uh, for iron, uh, you have amaranthus, I mean, you have the genus, I mean, so that instead of doing uh, uh, enrichment of uh, rice with iron, I mean, you could as well plant amaranthus or ginadropsis or anacardium, and, and then you create that at the landscape level, and at the same time, you improve the diversity and, and the uh, climate uh, resilience. Next. So let's uh, click next, next, I think we have a list of, uh, yeah, these are the, all the partners of the African Orphan Crop Consortium. You can see that it goes from uh, Research, Syngenta, Mars, uh, uh, NEPAD, and so on. So these are the partners. Next. And, and it also linked about the capacity, uh, building a 60 meter capacity of strengthening this partner uh, and having a program of the African plant breeder, a national program. We have trained five cohorts with more than 150 scientists from 28 countries, 90% PhD, 40% women, 125 crop, including six, uh, 60 of African orphan crop, put in place more than 520 breeding program that is really uh, truly pan-African. And we are starting a, a, a CRISP course. And this, this you can see that this combination with UC Davis, Mars, uh, uh, World Agroforestry, Agra, and Nepal. Next. And <clears throat> the thing is that what is happening at the landscape level that you have emerging property of a complex adaptive system that climate biodiversity and restoration gain. So there is no silver bullet. You have to create this landscape so that this emerging property emerge and that you can build on it and adapt it on it. Next. And again, I mean, a sort of some example, I mean, the diversity and nature as a silver bullet, you can see intercropping maize with legumes to supply nitrogen. And you see the result uh, compared to pure maize, that classical agroforestry, next. And, and, and you can see here that the impact of so of linking food security and land health, people that are in place where higher soil organic carbon have a better uh, food security and a better result in terms of the culture. So people are also limited by the characteristic of the place they are living and something you need to take into account in developing your integrated management system for food and nature. Next. And then you have to integrate everything through actionable evidence, data, information, and knowledge. And that's where you have a approach like SHARE that was developed in terms of uh, tailoring data, in terms of looking at how you visualize data, creating apps, and, and of course, uh, publishing a scientific uh, uh, journal uh, to maintain your uh, respectability and, and, and your relevance at, at the scientific community. Next. And after you are gathering all that through various tools uh, using the land degradation surveillance framework, for example, so you have a, a dashboard, you can look at soil organic carbon and, and, and then fundamentally, ultimately, diagnose and map and help the people, the community in terms of having this integrated management landscape. Next. And that's an example of Niger in terms of vegetation and soil organic carbon. Uh, next. And then example of some of the dashboard, uh, like the, the, the regreening uh, platform to bring together data, the regreening Africa dashboard and, and the link. I mean, you will have the presentation so you can test this, all these tools, but they are very important because if you just develop the thing without having possibility to extend, then it, it's not going to work. Next. And closing, I mean, a sort of, uh, you need to learn fast to adapt. Uh, and that's a 
I'm paraphrasing uh, Gravi here. Uh, you really are to adaptive collaborative management to link data to wise choice. You need to embrace uh, embrace diversity, resilience, uh, and your future depend on it. I mean, sort of, we have the model uh, and the understanding to model true now, and, and nature is still an ally, but not necessarily for a long time. And faced with uncertainty, you need to learn to fail small and fail safe, I mean, sort of, because uh, otherwise, people are not going to follow you. And at the same time, you need to try to win more often and more equitably. And you need to reward stewardship uh, and the steward of the lamb and, and think about uh, Aldo Leopold and the Sun County Almanac and move into uh, stewardship economy. And I think it's the last slide. Next. Yes. And sorry, I've been three or four minutes longer, but I try my best. And Ravi, my apologies for not having uh, true to your slides. I had to improvise a little bit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Robert. Off to you, Ali. Thanks, Robert. Um, you did a great job uh, with a little amount of time. Um, so thanks for that really great overview. Uh, and some of the themes that you touched on, definitely I'm going to take up here in this presentation. So. Uh, my name is Ali McLaddy, and I am the water and marine team lead for USAID's mission in Lima, Peru. And um, I wanted to talk to you all today about one of our programs, um, which I manage. And I think it's a really important type of program to consider uh, in terms of food security, even though it's primarily a water uh, activity. And so, yeah, I hope you'll take away from this, um, this quick presentation and also our panel discussion um, uh, a little bit about why I think water security, focused water security work is a really crucial part of what we need to be doing to um, support sustainable food systems, especially in the context of climate change. So I have this first slide up uh, showing a picture of uh, one of the places where um, our natural infrastructure for infrastructure for water security activity um, is doing some uh, restoration. Um, this is an activity that's co-funded by USAID in Canada. Uh, implemented by Forest Trends and, uh, and a lot of other partners. Uh, and basically what uh, NEWS, which we, we call it, is doing is um, supporting the development of what's uh, grown to be uh, almost a half billion dollar uh, portfolio of uh, investments in natural infrastructure for water security. Um, it's supporting uh, bringing those uh, projects from the concept stage uh, all the way up to being implemented on the ground uh, as uh, a, a method of, of increasing water security um, for, for Peruvians. Uh, and they're also focused on, on quantifying the benefits of those uh, investments. So next slide. But before I kind of go into what news is doing, I want to set the stage a little bit to try to um, double down on that uh, takeaway message about the importance of water security. Even for a region like uh, Latin America, which is um, really heavily endowed with water resources. So uh, LAC as a region has a third of the waters, uh, the world's water resources. And uh, its development has really been, been driven in part or underpinned by that endowment of, of water. Um, it's driven Latin America's status as the world's largest net exporting food exporting region. Um, it's also really green in terms of hydropower and electricity and um, the, the access to safe drinking water that has um, the water resources have contributed to have really improved the health and living conditions for millions of people. But um, on the flip side of this, the reliance on water has made the economy really vulnerable to water related risks and especially uh, under climate change. And a big portion of that is that um, water storage capacity is really decreasing. Um, the Andean glaciers, which are essential natural water regulators that guarantee water availability, especially during dry seasons, are retreating faster here than anywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, also land use changes, kind of tying back to Robert's presentation, are driving um, degradation of uh, other natural buffers against a variability in water supplies, such as Colombian Potamos, our high elevation uh, Andean wetlands, and, it, and also forests. Um, and kind of lack of adaptive capacity in that area is uh, could affect the livelihood of millions of people. So um, how does that relate to food security and food systems? Well, I think that, that back to that livelihoods part, um, many of these impacts are felt through the food system. 
Next slide. Zooming into Peru a little bit, this is a photo of um, where I live right now in Lima, uh, and you can see how arid it is. Peru is really um, facing a water crisis, uh, despite like the rest of LAC, a kind of large endowment of overall water resources. Most of the country's population and a big part of its agriculture take place uh, in one of the driest deserts in the world. Um, so, and this huge loss, 56% of loss of mountain glaciers, they're, they're the primary source of water storage uh, for the Pacific coast. And that, that, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of, uh, they're gone really, um, they're ghosts. Uh, so uh, trying to replace that storage and all of the natural regulation of water that they provide is, is a huge challenge. Um, the water crisis is also really exacerbating food security. We've seen a real increase in food insecurity in Peru here uh, as a result of both environmental and social causes. But um, according to the World Bank, the increase of frequency of droughts along with this shrinking glacier storage, um, in addition to, to more extreme floods, uh, is going to uh, most heavily impact the agricultural sector. Um, and uh, I just wanted to point out that Peru's export economy is really um, growing in the ag sector. So uh, really water intensive crops like blueberries, uh, asparagus, artichokes, uh, those are some of the biggest exports after mining. And they, they, they make up a big portion of, um, of uh, Peru's uh, GDP. And they're really reliant on the same uh, sources of glacial, glacial water that, that the cities are. Next slide. So um, we here at the Peru mission wanted to try to promote water, our nature positive ways of addressing these water issues. And so uh, the natural infrastructure for water security activity is really um, focused on um, uh, building from Peru's uh, public um, system of, um, it's a policy shift that happened here to kind of prioritize or allow for natural infrastructure investment alongside gray infrastructure. Um, and so uh, we here at the mission were really interested in supporting that to, as a way to increase climate resilience, both for cities like Lima and for, um, for ag systems. Uh, so, you know, water security for rural and uh, uh, urban areas alike. And um, so basically the, the program is, uh, helps to identify areas where um, investments in things like uh, forests, grasslands, wetlands, uh, complemented by soil and water conservation practices like amunas, which is a picture that you'll see on the, I think it's you guys' right-hand side. That's a, an ancient pre-Incan uh, way of uh, managing water that um, has been shown to, to really increase dry season, spring flow, and, and river flow, as well as terraces. Uh, as, a, as a way to um, scaling those uh, type of restoration investments up as a way to manage uh, these, these growing water risks. Um, so next slide. So hopefully, uh, I want to, yeah, so now I'm going to focus on, on, on the, on the natural infrastructure activity and, uh, what it's been able to achieve so far in terms of growing that uh, portfolio. So as I, as I mentioned before, um, a few years ago, well, it's more like a decade now, uh, there were some really innovative things on the policy side here in Peru where the water sector regulators, um, along with our ministry and environment, uh, passed some, some regulation to allow for investment in natural infrastructure alongside gray infrastructure, um, including uh, allowing water utilities to uh, set aside a, a portion of their tariffs for, for investments in natural infrastructure. Um, and that, uh, that grew the pot available for investing in, in restoration uh, really, really rapidly. However, um, this is the public investment system, which is already very, very slow, lack of shovel-ready projects, lack of clear quantification of the water benefits of different investments, um, and lack of coordination across sectors like water, uh, ag, and environment uh, in order to sort of secure benefits at the landscape scale. So NEWS has been um, uh, addressing that bottleneck and also providing support for uh, backing up this policy uh, that exists right now. Um, and you can see in this uh, slide that, that basically this portfolio of projects um, that are from like conception stage all the way to having been implemented on the ground has grown tremendously with, uh, with their support. So up to $440 million. 
Um, and this is the largest portfolio of natural infrastructure investments uh, in the region, much larger than any private or donor funded portfolios. Uh, this is all based on the public investment system. So it's a great example of domestic resource mobilization for climate adaptation. Um, and uh, you can see on the right hand side that graph uh, is showing um, the different sectors uh, within the uh, system that are that represent that portfolio. So a lot of it is coming from this fund called ARC, which is uh, a reconstruction fund, a public reconstruction fund that was established after the 2017, 2018 uh, El Nino event. And uh, the rest is coming from different pots of money um, that that regional and utility uh, regional governments and utilities uh, have established, you know, that were enabled by this policy shift, saying that we we want to invest in natural infrastructure alongside gray infrastructure for water security. Um, but there's really uh, a, a problem still. This is like a huge portfolio, but uh, only have um, about less than a tenth of that is like uh, actually on the ground uh, finished. And so we just launched a second phase of the natural infrastructure for water security activity. Um, it's going to go through uh, 2027 now, um, and we're uh, we're hoping to make sure that this investment uh, continues to move forward and we continue to build the momentum, including um, extending uh, this this uh, user fee uh, model of um, investment in natural infrastructure uh, from the drinking water sector to the ag sector, uh, working with irrigation and other agricultural user groups. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, but um, I'm really excited to take everybody's questions about, about how this fits into uh, sustainable food systems um, during the Q&A, over. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Ali. We'll now pass it over to Mofat. Thank you very much uh, and welcome everybody. Uh, very happy to join today's event. And again, continue the discussion on mainstreaming uh, natural resources management. I'm going to basically give a little bit of a highlights of African examples of, right now, mostly with Mozambique, but maybe also as relevant uh, in some other African countries uh, that we work in. Uh, next slide. Oh yeah, so this is just sort of an introductory uh, uh, slide there to remind everybody that yes, I'm, I'm mostly going to be speaking about Mozambique, but I previously was also working quite a lot with our Feed the Future uh, uh, initiative and uh, as, as a coordinator, mostly for climate and natural resources management in agriculture. But basically, we, we, we really do need to reform food systems, um, both for nourishment and environmental sustainability. And um, a country's agri agricultural biodiversity uh, really is, is, a, is a very important uh, culturally appropriate and locally adapted uh, nutrition uh, uh, food sources. And we, at the same time, need to make sure that we, we enhance climate resilience uh, crops, um, uh, crops and animal breeds. Um, agricultural biodiversity is already widely uh, integrated into global farming and breeding systems. But basically, the agrobiodiversity index, um, as already mentioned by Robert, uh, 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 supports policymakers and the private sector, as, as we've had also um, uh, in other contexts, in assessing agricultural uh, biodiversity for informed interventions and investments in um, sustainable food systems. Uh, next slide, please. And so the key word here, I guess, is regenerative. and. Regenerative food systems are those that really will work for people, certainly uh, so, in terms of livelihoods and nurturing and all that, but also enhance nature. We're talking about our soils, our water, our forests, our rivers, our lakes, oceans, and so on. And suddenly, therefore, also the planet, because what we need to do is obviously we have to feed the population. We have to feed uh, our current population, and 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 but we not only have to that we have to do it sustainably it can be in the old way of very extractive we, we we need basically to move away from what we can think of as extractive kind of um a food system basically where we are heavily heavily subsidizing or introducing um implement or or products 
um, say fertilizer and so on from ex externally without using what is locally available. So that, that's the first step. Uh, but, but then also ultimately we want to, uh, again, kind of move away from system to a more um, uh, succular kind of a production system. And I, I put these pictures here just to kind of highlight for you a little bit of what I've, what we have uh, in, in Mozambique in the context of reliance, reliance on natural resources uh, from, from the land, from the ocean, uh, as well as the, you know, basically our, our soils and um, our soils and, and, and water in the system. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the theme, and I think also from what um, uh, Emily Weeks uh, started off with, is that we really want to find out what lessons have we learned in terms of you, uh, considering natural resources management as a linchpin uh, for food systems, basically, again, that work for people, nature, and planet. And I, I can basically have three, three projects that we have in Mozambique that actually work on this concept and, and expand on how we utilize natural resources to enhance livelihoods, basically produce food, but also and grow incomes for people and also nourish people. So the first one is our resilient Ngorongosa. We could spend the entire hour discussing a little bit about how this uh, integrated activity happens. So to me, and I think we'll get a lot of the question and um, uh, panel questions, we will discuss a little bit about details of how exactly we do uh, uh, natural resource, um, um, resources management as a linchpin for food systems. And the resilient Gorongosa activity that we have really does this. We coordinate with biodiversity funding, with agriculture funding, with education, with um, uh, health, to really look at areas around the buffer zone of, the, of a national park, the, the flagship national park, if you, if you will, in, uh, in Mozambique to enhance both the conservation of important um, uh, wildlife and, and animal and plant resources, as, as well as enhance the livelihoods of people surrounding that area. So that is our resilient Gorongosa activity. I'll be very happy to give more examples exactly how we are sort of uh, um, implementing that activity. The, the second project I wanted to highlight for you is the resilient coastal communities activity, where we did a co-creation uh, really looking at uh, multiple actors al along the coast. Mozambique is a huge coastal country, almost 300 kilometers. And therefore, we wanted to be able to invest as we think about improving livelihoods, improving uh, food security, improving nutrition. We wanted to think about ways to uh, work along the coast uh, to, to deliver these important um, uh, elements relating to food security and economic growth. And again, the base is uh, natural resources management. So it's the, it's the water, it's the fisheries, it's, it's the um, mangroves and so on. And thirdly, the, the, the last one I want to highlight is a new activity that we just awarded a couple of weeks ago called Planeta, which is being implemented by a group called um, Cross Boundary. And it's a carbon, uh, carbon benefits uh, activity, basically, um, uh, a carbon investment facilitation platform to help communities really understand what their natural resources are, how much carbon they could potentially sequester, and how they can get paid uh, through the, uh, the mitigation efforts that we have globally. And this, the picture that you see here is a, a, a landscape uh, in a national park next to Ngorongosa, actually. This one is called Shimoy, uh, this one is called uh, Shimanimani, and there are a lot of such landscapes in Mozambique. How can Mozambican communities actually benefit from all the carbon that can be stored in this system? And at the same time, achieve uh, biodiversity protection, enhance uh, life. Hey everybody, it looks like we lost Mofat for just a second. Uh, we'll give him a moment to try and rejoin. And uh, if not, we might switch over into the Q&A section for a minute. Thank you so much for your patience.
All right, yeah, I think we're gonna have Emily go ahead and ask a couple of questions and then we will return back to Mofat for him to give a couple of remarks when he is able to join us. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to our panelists and uh, our opening remarks from Roberto. We do have quite a few questions to go through today. Um, and we also have some general questions for our panelists, but given Mofat's um, struggling to, to get back on, we'll just pause on our, our overview questions and, and uh, tackle some of those questions that have come into the chat. So I wanted to start off, uh, Roberto, uh, there's a question for you that uh, we'd like to address. The question is, the smart land tenure agreements are impressive policy changes. Would love details on how they were achieved. What strategy, evidence people did C4 use to achieve these? Thank you, Robert. Thanks, I mean, as a first, first, I should not claim any uh, credit for C4. That was the uh, ECRAF colleagues that thought that now it's C4 ECRAF, so we are the same, but what, what happened is that 80% of the deforestation in, in, in the Peruvian Amazon is by small order of it's one to five hectares. And, and the, the, the problem is that we have these people, a large number, I mean, so like in San Martin, probably more than 120,000 households that are already in the forest or they have deforested parts. So what, what do you do with, with these people? You, you kick them out, it's a bit difficult. You let them do what they continue to do and they will increase deforestation. Uh, and so that's where, in fact, the Peruvian government came with the idea. So okay, let's, let's give some title <clears throat> to these people, uh, but with some uh, constraints uh, so that uh, deforestation does not increase. And in the place that have been degraded, uh, we had more trees in the landscape, and, and and that's that's the idea of the agroforestry concession. And when what uh, ICRAF and uh, and C4 ICRAF has been doing is providing a platform, providing a training, providing technology, so that people, when they have this title, they know what to do with it because it, it's it's very nice to give the title to the people, but if you don't give them the capacity to use that the way you want to use it, you just continue the deforestation in another place. So that's, we are, cannot claim that we have put in place the agroforestry concession. What we have put in place is the various support mechanism, the various uh, uh, adaptation, the various uh, technology, the various uh, advice, so that people engage in this agroforestry concession. And these are success that means that they stop the deforestation at the farm level and at the landscape level by, by uh, addition. And at the same time, they increase the tree cover in the place that have been deforested or in the culture uh, through agroforestry practice. Thank you, Robert. Uh, coming back, Moffat, welcome back. Uh, we, apologies, had to move on to Q&A. Weren't too sure how long you would be absent. But uh, we are moving on to our panel questions of which you're more than welcome to finish off some of your points during particularly this uh, initial question. So Ali and Mofat, this question is more specifically directed to you and the programming on the ground. Uh, the question is, what effective ways have you seen to mainstream NRM, including climate adaptation and mitigation, water resource management and land and natural resource governance into agriculture food systems? So there's a collection of uh, integration there and mainstreaming opportunities and welcome your uh, thoughts and insight on this question. Um, maybe Mofat, starting with you. And again, if you had any extra points you were about to make, please feel free. Thank you. Yeah, apologies, uh, the internet just dropped uh, uh, unceremoniously. But um, yes, the, the, the key thing I wanted to highlight at the end was just kind of give a little bit of a map of um, Mozambique, just to give folks uh, the context for um, the work we do, the, 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 natural air, the national protected area and some of the major agricultural areas and where we have some of the uh, 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 fisheries and coastal activities. But all set, I think I'll get to the question and I think that's the more interesting discussion to have. And to me, I think a key thing is integration and thinking together uh, jointly is, is a key. Yes, this is a slide that I was, as I was wanting to kind of end up with. And actually it's a good spot actually to, to launch off with our questions. 
um, uh, Q&A. Because what I, what I feel happens oftentimes, and this is also maybe a problem with, say, donor communities, sometimes it's something with the private sector in terms of how ministries are structured, there's often that thing of ring fencing and everybody kind of thinking, this is my lane and this is what I do. I put my nose to the grinder and I do my work. But really, I think as we saw also the examples from, uh, from each of this, the slides of all our panelists, you see that that idea of looking at multiple sectors, multiple uh, scales is really, really important. And you won't do that if you're not doing integration. So the key thing here is really having conversations, having conversations among sectors, having conversations among various funding streams and, and planning things jointly. It takes time, it takes effort. It wouldn't just happen uh, spontaneously. And, and to me, I feel like part of what we've learned, for instance, from the Ngorongosa project, which I, again, will also really encourage everybody to check out, uh, is that this is a place where we say, we've pulled all this money together. There is a planning that happens as a system, as the whole entire Ngorongosa landscape, whether you're doing health, education, uh, agriculture, infrastructure, how, how are we going to address the problems that the, the, the needs of people in a, in a given landscape? And how are we going to pull the resources that we have to, yes, fundamentally support the natural resource base, and then you build off your economy off of that. So to me, I think integration is the key word that is necessary and a must. And over. Thank you, Moffat. Ali, over to sure. you. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Moffat um, definitely very strongly. I think maybe what I have to add is, um, is uh, again, back to water. I think look, water is a nice lens for integrating because it does affect so many of the other different sectors. So I think one of the experiences here in Peru is just around how valuable conversations about, um, about watersheds are in terms of bringing different stakeholders and different sectors together to integrate um, the lens through which we're looking at, uh, at watersheds and how they function uh, and provide services for, for cities and for, um, for upstream users who are using it uh, water primarily for agriculture, and um, I think you know in this case we don't we don't have any food security funding here in Peru uh, right now at least uh, development funding, and so um, you know back to that point about integration I think uh, through our water and adaptation programming we're really able to um, to to look holistically I think at uh, at water uh, and how it's serving uh, different sectors including agriculture. Um, one other thing to highlight for me is just uh, the policy landscape um, and how how much uh, USAID can do to support um, when there is, uh, and, and actually Robert was giving an example of the agroforestry concessions here in Peru, that was a policy shift, but similar to the shift about um, how we how we look at uh, water security and wanting to, to use nature to our to our advantage. I think um, that policy shift and the, the the opportunity that came with the establishment of agri agroforestry concessions um, both needed a ton of support, uh, technical assistance to make uh, good on those promises and to kind of continue the momentum of those types of policy shifts uh, at the at the country level. So, I think um, USAID and other donor support uh, for making sure that those good policy decisions are uh, are successful uh, is also really important to to uh, improving natural resources management with, with good outcomes for everyone. I think actually just one other point um, on payment for ecosystem services kind of schemes like uh, the one that natural infrastructure for water security is, is uh, utilizing. Um, and just uh, there's added benefits to livelihoods for local communities that are uh, dependent uh, on, on agriculture uh, for the majority of their livelihood. But I think, um, uh, Giving some benefit financially uh, to those communities, I think, has also opened up a door uh, to improved practices on, in other areas of natural resources management just by um, just by uh, reducing uh, poverty. Um, and so that's another another uh, example, I think, of integration of uh, payment for ecosystem services for water, um, helping to improve uh, livelihoods and um, agricultural food systems uh, in in upper watersheds as well. I'll stop there. Thank you. And just tagging on to that, uh, coming back to the barriers in regards to integration, 
what in summary you would see as the main barriers and, and how you think we can best overcome them. Uh, maybe starting with you, Ali. I mean, I think it's a really different story for like USAID has very specific uh, barriers for integration, which I think you touched on, Emily, and I think uh, the report that uh, you led uh, with Diane in our Resilience and Food Security Bureau really kind of hit on these themes. I mean, sometimes we're, we're really constrained by, um, by different uh, directives that come from Congress, for example, and also internally uh, that say this is how you need to program these particular uh, these particular flavors of money. Um, and then we set up our, our structures to follow that money. Um, and so, uh, you know, and we don't have always have time to, um, as Moffitt was mentioning, to uh, work together between our different, uh, between our different sectors in USAID to, to come up with integrated solutions. Um, so, you know, time and money, I, I guess that's not a very satisfying answer. Um, I guess I will say, um, one of the things that's happening in our mission right now that's been really helpful uh, is um, planning for climate integration has really had some good benefits for integrating natural resources management into all of our sectors. And we've just been stepping back um, to, to see how we can collaborate um, through the lens of climate uh, resilience. And I think that's led to some really interesting, not necessarily funding integrated uh, activities, but um, integrated approaches to tackling problems like uh, cocoa eradication is a big area for us, but how does that how does that relate to carbon sequestration and other ecosystem services? So um, yeah, I think it's really a matter of being intentional about um, letting the the problems drive the the solutions programmatically and um, you know while doing our best to, to stay true to, to to funding streams and and what we're asked to do um, policy wise in different sectors. Great, thank you, Ali. Uh, I just also wanted to note, um, there are some, as Ali uh, noted, some of these uh, extra recommendations coming out of the report that you can review um, very much in line with what you're, you're mentioning. Uh, Moffat, handing it over to you as well. Yes, and actually you also would uh, encourage everybody to potentially just look at the reports that uh, Diane and, and Mike Colby and uh, Jennifer Hart worked on because they are very important uh, aspects that were generated from those. So that's a good reference. And, um, but really, uh, Ali mentioned it, uh, very important, the, the money, the money trail, that's always the, the king, I, I suppose. And, and um, how, how, how Congress allots uh, and, and, and uh, funds various initiatives kind of drive what gets measured, how it gets measured, and that also then kind of structures how, how well integration will happen. And I think um, the very big example of thinking about how programming happened at USAID is, is maybe from PEPFA, where there was this amount of money and, and they, they, they measured these sorts of things, and you see a lot of action on that. Now, for us, when we think about natural resources management, food security, all these economic growth kinds of initiatives. Again, I feel like if if the, the key hindrance is maybe the, the flavor of the money, but also maybe the types of individuals or the, 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 the framing that people think about, whether, whether in terms of thinking about programs that you're doing, do you want to be linking appropriately with others or don't, or you kind of want to, hone in on what concerns only you and you you, you kind of just focus on that, a, a manageable interest question. So to me, I feel like it's it's personalities, it's the kind of money we have that, that somebody is programming, uh, but also maybe also a policy element. And to me, I feel this is where there could be big, uh, big, big push in terms of policy prescriptions that that kind of get at uh, a broader, more, more uh, what, what do you say? Uh, more integrated kind of thinking. And, and to me, I will again um, uh, second Ali's point that uh, climate programming, for instance, is one thing that is also kind of helping join efforts much more in a more integrated way than we have historically. So to me, I think those barriers are, are, are very, there are many common ones in, across countries. But of course, there are also some specific ones to particular countries. But I think the report that uh, you talked about, Emily, 
we'll highlight for people who want to kind of figure out what these barriers are. Thank you, Mofa. I think you cut out, but we're at the end of that sentence. Uh, again, we really appreciate both of you here today for providing this additional input and insight, uh, given your breadth of experience across missions and within Washington. I think we've picked the, some really uh, key experts here. So lastly, uh, again, building off of these questions, uh, some of, as you noted, the challenges we face are out of our control. There's not much we can do to make movement in regards to flavor of money and, and time constraints. So what are the biggest opportunities, particularly in light of our new climate strategy and our uh, GF, uh, GFSS refresh and, and any other uh, new uh, changes or, or documents or strategies or policies coming through that you think might really give us some, some extra leverage to be able to improve on our integration and, and some of the aspects of, of uh, um, work that you're touched on today. Ali, I'll, I'll start with you again. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Thanks, Emily. Um, two things kind of come to mind for me. First, I just want to um, highlight that, um, and Emily knows this very well, but folks in the field that don't always um, follow as closely the updates to strategies that, that Emily was talking about. So in terms of um, the global water strategy, uh, which was just uh, its second, its first refresh was uh, released uh, last year in 2022. Uh, and the global food security strategy, two big um, uh, guiding documents for um, investments in food security and water. Um, both of them have opened up a bit uh, in terms of um, uh, recognizing the importance of natural resources management uh, to food security and to um, you know water security, but uh, you know particularly to the sustainability of uh, water and sanitation services. So, um, you know, I think there is a policy opening within those two sectors, uh, especially, and then add on top of that, uh, the climate strategy, which I think um, because of the, the focus on integrating climate into every sector is really opening up conversations uh, within missions. Um, yeah, so those are two big, three big policy changes that I think um, open the door for conversations and for more integrated uh, programming, uh, both Water and food security now have very similar water resources management um, parts of their results framework, and so that's a that's a big opportunity to to do integrated programming when you have that policy overlap. I think the localization agenda is also an interesting one for us to think about because I I think when you talk to our local partners, they don't see. I mean, we are very specific at USAID. The talk about money and flavors of money that's really a USAID internal thing, and people don't think about development problems like that uh, on the ground obviously. Um, and so the focus on uh, increasing uh, the uh, local ownership and local participation in the development of our projects, I think really also opens the door, uh, if we're serious about it, to, to developing more integrated programming, regardless of the flavor of funding. Thank you. And uh, Moffat, back to you for final comments and on this topic before we move to Q&A. Uh, can you refresh, Emily? I, I may have missed. Uh, what was what's what's the response? What so the the question, kind of the rounding off question, was around key opportunities, particularly in light of some of the changes uh, uh, coming out of our policies and strategies, or opportunities from missions, uh, you know, CDCSs or other key documents. And um, okay, and, yeah. Oh, th thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so. To me, I think a little bit going to Ali's last point there, I, I often think that when we are doing development, what we must try to think in all our sectoral boxes is basically to try to think like a head of a household or a head of a state. It's like everything is your business. And how are you going to be able to achieve these objectives while also achieving these um, inter interlinked uh important factors. So for us, I feel like um, re really looking from the integrated approach is, 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 is a must. And um, I, I feel like uh, the strategies oftentimes are very obviously specific to a sector or a country. You know, when you think about a CDCS or when you kind of think about 
the global food security strategy or the water strategy. I, I think we have a nutrition is it a nutrition policy or nutrition strategy and a biodiversity policy in there. So all these policies, we, we really, in as much as we still have our funding earmarks and, and obligations, we again have to, we need to think jointly. Let, let's also kind of try to look over the fence and see what are the people who are doing nutrition and food safety doing? How is it linked to maybe an element that is going to, for instance, reduce uh, uh, um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, you know? Or if I'm working on this other side with the water and sanitation, how, how am I thinking about all the work that we're investing in upland areas to enhance biodiversity that will also enhance the water flow and water supply? So to me, I think that's how we must maybe try to think about some of, our, some of the programs we're going to be rolling out. Thank you. Thank you, Mafat. And again, thank you to our panelists. This was uh, definitely an enriching uh, discussion and presentation. So we're just going to finish off with some key questions that came from the audience. I want to start off, Ali, I'm going to hand it back to you. There is a question uh, specific to your Peru uh, presentation. Uh, the question is, is the 500 million for water security in Peru alone lack or global? Pretty relatively yeah, strange. easy question. Yeah, that's just Peru, and it's all public funding, actually. So it's all um, uh, funding generated through the tax base or through tariffs on uh, water users, uh, but it's been earmarked for investment in natural infrastructure. And um, yeah, that's the value of uh, the entire portfolio of investments in natural infrastructure in Peru. Thank you. And Robert, we haven't heard from you for a little while. So there's a question addressed to, to you and your presentation. What are the key factors that determine uh, right tree at the right place for the right reason? Okay, yes. The right tree at the right place for the right reason. Is yeah. there a key that is commonly used? Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> I think that you have the, the, the first thing that will come to mind to anybody is that, uh, yeah, you preferably plant the tree that is growing there so that you are not going to have a so if, if you are in the temperate zone you are not going to plant a tropical tree or if you are in the boreal zone you are not going to plant a tropical tree that's the obvious one and and i think that what is very often overlooked and and, and depends very well is, is that what do people want and and we always come with the thing that oh maybe, let's take an example that is very often topical on eucalypts Eucalypts are bad. Eucalypts are sucking the water, and, and then you go to a village in uh, <clears throat> or a farmer around Addis Abeba, and you ask them, "What do you want to plant?" I want eucalypts because uh, uh, it's easy to grow, and I have a sure market uh, selling charcoal to uh, people in Addis, and it's less work, less intensive uh, than uh, normal farming, <clears throat> and then it provides a better return. Now, is it the right tree? It's a different question because effectively, if, if you remove uh, the water uh, provisioning of, of Addis Abeba, you have a problem. So it's I don't there is not a single answer to this question, but what is needed is to look at all the elements, what the people want, what the ecology of the place allow you to grow, and the, the one that is becoming more and more pregnant is okay, we are planting trees, so it's long living organism. What is going to happen in 20 years from now with climate changing? If you plant the tree now, expect to harvest them 50 years from now, you better plant them so that they grow now, but also in 50 years from now. And this is something that is still very much uh, in infancy in terms of developing the, these models. What are we going to plant now so that the things are done? that All these questions that you need to ask and, and preferably not put that's common sense. Do not put all your eggs in the same basket. That means do not plant only one tree species. Plant a portfolio of trees that provide more chances to survive or to be resilient to the landscape change and to provide a variety of benefits to the ecosystem and to the people. Thank you, Robert. Coming back to you, Mafat, uh, please explain how you help communities quantify their carbon sequestration. 
Yes, this is a big question and one that, uh, of course, is sometimes pretty contentious. Uh, we, we mostly have relied or we are going to be relying on experts that uh, already do inventory. But a lot of the work we anticipate is really more on the deal making to link buyers and sellers. The actual work of inventory and validation and so on is really in the hands of a lot of um, external uh, entities. So we, 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 as USAID, are not going to be doing any of that inventory work. But we anticipate that uh, there's some capacity within um, uh, entities uh, in, in Mozambique, as well as uh, foreign, uh, foreign entities that are going to be providing estimates uh, for how much, how much a, a mangrove grove can, it contains, how much a, a forest contains. We have a lot of miombo woodland in the country. We have um, several experts that uh, have very good quantified and validated methodologies, including a long-term transect in Niasa that quantify how much carbon above ground, below ground exists. I, I'm sure uh, Robe can also mention maybe some of the methodologies that C4 has supported through the years in terms of uh, carbon inventory uh, in across landscapes. But the other point also is something like say avoided emissions, including from transportation sector and so on. But that's not really something we are looking at, but we want to figure out, I saw there was also a question a little bit touching on maybe some of the elements of ownership, who owns what land and a lot of the land is owned by government and therefore the government has a huge chunk to, to say this money ought to be paid to, for the government. But we, we really are insisting that there ought to be ways to figure out how those carbon payments flow to communities. And the question is, who is in what communities and how much carbon do they have? Uh, that's a, a technical question, I think, that um, uh, can be answered, that has an answer. The more difficult part is really determining how this international finance for carbon flows to communities. But we've seen it happen in other countries, and we want to make it happen for Mozambique. Over. Thank you, Mafa. And our last question that we have time for today is back to you, Ali, uh, regarding the use of water use fees as mechanisms towards sustainability. Has news uh, also trained locals in maintenance and repairs of the infrastructure? Um, and then there's a comment. We have found that to be critical as the presence of financial resources in sustaining water infrastructure. Yes, I mean, I, th I think there's maybe two issues in this question. One is about uh, the drinking water infrastructure, um, which I think um, my experience in the past working on 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 wash um, for sure, uh, uh, figuring out sustainable operations and maintenance for uh, water drinking water and sanitation infrastructure is 100% critical. I mean, we've seen that over and over again that. Uh, I think there's a study about borehole uh, installation across Africa and something about five or 10 years later, um, the, the, rate of, um, the rate of functionality for those uh, pieces of infrastructure, you know, falling to uh, something around 25%. Um, I don't know if I have those numbers right, but yeah, it's a huge issue. And I, I think it's interesting to bring it up in terms of nat natural infrastructure too, and maybe connecting back to um, some of the uh, themes that Robert was talking about in terms of choosing the right tree for the right time and knowing that a tree uh, can live for a very long time. I mean, I think natural infrastructure um, is a newer type of infrastructure that um, that Peru uh, and through the public investment system is is constructing uh, or using. Um, but we haven't had that conversation about uh, operations and maintenance very much um, here. And I think it's it's really critical because uh, just as a, a borehole needs to be maintained in order to maintain functionality, um, you know, a reforestation project also needs to be maintained and you need to have funding and training to maintain that and make sure the investment that you made um, is gonna uh, reap benefits um, uh, for a long time in terms of water regulation in that case. So I think it's a really good point and uh, we're really starting to think about it right now. Um, th this is very uh, particular to Peru, but um, the way the payments work uh, here to take the, the fees uh, from the water users and use them for restoration projects in uh, upper watersheds, it's not really uh, allowing for a continual payment um, to maintain those. And so that's one of the things we're going to be working on in the second phase of news is how do we how do we make sure there's a payment stream for maintaining these uh, investments in natural infrastructure?
So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Thank you to the panelists again, uh, Moffat and Ali, for uh, providing your answers to these questions. And if there are additional questions, I'm sure there's op opportunity to reach out to address those. Thank you, Robert, for opening remarks. And I also wanted to give a big thank you to Diane Russell, uh, Julius Bright Ross, who have actually been the behind the scenes pull this together and uh, particularly for not just event, but the entire month. Uh, there are some fantastic blogs on AgriLinks related to this theme. Please do check them out. And we also have uh, an upcoming event, an actual in-person event that you can register for in person. You can also attend virtually. Uh, Michael has put it in the chat. It is uh, just and sustainable foods, find, building partnerships for just and sustainable food systems. We're really excited to have, uh, again, the opportunity to meet in person, to network and to discuss a, a key topic uh, related to this theme and bring together partners um, in this regards. So again, thank you for joining us. Thank you uh, to our speakers and panelists, and we look forward to continuing to collaborate and build on these conversations. Thank you, Michael, as well, and team. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Thank you, everybody.